So to continue with the acute kidney injury, the diagnostic study is involved. A thorough history is essential for diagnosing the etiology of AKI. Consider pre-renal causes when there is a history of dehydration, blood loss, or severe heart disease. An increase in serum creatinine may not be evident until there is a loss of more than 50% of kidney function. Urinalysis is an important diagnostic test. The urine osmolality, sodium content, and specific gravity are measured, and urine sediment, hematuria, pyuria, and crystals may be seen. Kidney ultrasonography is often the first test done because it provides imaging without exposure to potentially nephrotoxic contrast agents. A renal scan can help assess abnormalities in kidney blood flow, tubular function, and the collecting system. A computed tomographic scan or a CT scan can identify lesions and ma masses as well as obstructions and vascular anomalies. Renal biopsy is considered the best method for confirming intrarenal causes of AKI. For confirming intrarenal causes of um, AKI. Collaborative care. So the primary goals of acute kidney injury is eliminating the cause, managing the signs and symptoms, and preventing complications. Pre-renal and post-renal AKI that has not caused intrarenal damage usually resolves quickly and with treatment of the cause. However, when parenchymal damage occurs due to either pre-renal or post-renal causes, or when parenchymal damage occurs directly as with intrarenal causes, AKI has a prolonged course. Because AKI is potentially reversible, the primary goals of treatment are to eliminate the cause, manage the signs and symptoms, and prevent complications while the kidneys recover. Ensuring adequate intravascular volume and cardiac output. The first step is to determine if there is adequate intravascular volume and cardiac output to ensure adequate kidney perfusion. A fluid challenge of 500 ml of normal saline is given to confirm pre-renal cause. Closely monitor fluid intake during the oliguric phase of AKI. The general rule for calculating the fluid restriction is to add all the losses for the previous 24 hours, example urine, diarrhea, MSS, blood, etc., plus 600 ml for insensible loss, example respiration and diaphoresis. Diuretic therapy is or the, especially the loop or osmotic diuretics are usually recommended. Hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia is one of the most serious complications in AKI because it can cause life-threatening cardiac dysrhythmias. Both insulin and sodium bicarbonate serve as a temporary measure for treatment of hyperkalemia by promoting a shift of potassium into the cells. Calcium gluconate raises the threshold at which dysrhythmias will occur, serving to temporarily stabilize the myocardium. Only sodium polystyrene sulfonate or K-exalate and dialysis actually removes the potassium from the body. In the bowel, potassium is exchanged for sodium. When mixed in water with sorbitol, osmotic di diarrhea is produced, decreasing the potassium level. Never give cakes late to a patient with paralytic ileus because bowel necrosis can occur. Renal replacement therapy. The most common indications for RRT in AKI are volume overload resulting in compromised cardiac or pulmonary status, elevated serum potassium level, metabolic acidosis where the serum bicarbonate level is less than 15 MEQ per liter, Bund levels greater than 120, significant changes in mental, mental status, and pericarditis, pericardial effusion, or cardiac tamponade. For RRT, intermittent hemodialysis is usually used more than peritoneal dialysis. CRRT, or continuous renal replacement therapy, is provided continuously over approximately 24 hours through cannulation of an artery and vein. It is much slower than RRT. 
Hemodialysis is the method of choice when rapid changes are required in a short period of time. Rapid fluid shifts during hemodialysis can cause hypotension. Nutritional therapy. The challenge of nutritional management in AKI is to provide adequate calories to prevent catabolism despite the restrictions need necessary to prevent electrolyte disorders, fluid disorders, and azotemia. A primary nutritional, nutritional goal in AKI is to maintain adequate calorie intake, providing 30 to 35 kilocalories per kilogram and 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per kilogram of desired body weight to prevent further breakdown of body protein for energy purposes. Adequate energies should be primarily from carbohydrate and fat sources to prevent ketosis from endogenous fat breakdown and gluconeogenesis from muscle protein breakdown. Supplementation of essential amino acids can be given for amino acid replacement. Dietary restriction of potassium to 40 MEQs per day is recommended to prevent recurrent elevation of potassium. Sodium is restricted as needed to prevent edema, hypertension, and heart failure. Dietary fat intake is increased so that, the, so that the patient receives at least 30 to 40 percent of total calories from fat. Fat emulsion IV infusions given as a nutrition supplement provide a good source of non-protein calories. If a patient cannot maintain adequate oral intake, enteral nutrition is a preferred route for nutritional support. When the GI tract is not functional, parenteral nutrition is necessary to provide adequate nutrition. The patient treated with parenteral nutrition may need daily hemodialysis or CRRT to remove the excess fluid. Concentrated formulas of parenteral nutrition are available to minimize fluid volume. So nursing management. So this includes, includes nursing assessment, measuring the vital signs, and also maintaining a strict intake and output. Daily monitoring of patients' urine output is essential because this information provides prognostic implications and is also crucial in determining therapy and daily fluid volume replacement. Examine the color for urine, for, uh, for color spe urine specific gravity, glucose, proteins, blood, and sediments. Assess the patient's general appearance, including skin color, edema, neck vein distension, and bruises. If a patient is receiving dialysis, observe the access site for signs of inflammation and exudate. Evaluate the patient's mental status and level of consciousness. Examine the oral mucosa for dryness and inflammation. Auscultate the lungs for crackles and ronchi or diminished breath sounds. Monitor the heart for the presence of any gallops, S3 gallop, murmurs, or pericardial friction rub. Assess ECG readings for the presence or development of dysrhythmias, and review labor laboratory values and diagnostic test results. Nursing diagnosis pertaining um, are some of them are excess fluid volume related to kidney failure and fluid retention, risk for infection related to invasive lines, uremic toxins, and altered immune responses secondary to kidney failure, fatigue related to anemia, metabolic acidosis, and uremic toxins, and anxiety related to disease process, therapeutic interventions, and uncertainty of prognosis, and potential complications um, like dysrhythmias related to electrolyte imbalances. So the planning phase, the overall goals for this patient would be completely recover without any loss of kidney function, maintain normal fluid and electrolyte balance, have decreased anxiety and comply, compliance with and understanding the need for careful follow-up care. Nursing implementation. Health promotion, identify and monitor populations at high risk for AKI. Control exposure to nephrotoxic drugs, especially through buying over-the-counter drugs and industrial chemicals. Prevent prolonged episodes of hypotension and hypovolemia. 
um, dehydration in hot climates, etc. Health promotion in the hospital. The factors that increase the risk for developing AKI are the presence of pre-existing um, chronic kidney disease, older age, massive trauma, major surgical procedures, extensive burns, cardiac failure, sepsis, and obstetric complications. Carefully monitoring intake and output, maintaining fluid balance and electrolyte balance is essential. Assess and record extra renal losses of fluid from vomiting, diarrhea, hemorrhage, and increase in insensible loss. Prompt replacement of significant fluid losses will help prevent ischemic tubular damage associated with trauma, burns, and extensive surgery. Intake and output records and patient's weight provide valuable indicators of fluid volume status. Aggressive diuretic therapy for the patient with fluid overload resulting from any cause can lead to a reduction in renal blood flow. Nephrotoxic drugs should be used sparingly in a patient at high risk. With, when these drugs must be used, they should be given in the smallest effective doses for the shortest possible periods. NSAIDs can worsen kidney function. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors can also decrease perfusion pressure and cause hyperkalemia. Acute interventions. Observe and record accurate intake and output. Measure daily weights with the same scale at the same time each day to allow for the evaluation and detection of excessive gains or losses of body fluid. One kilogram is equal to 1000 ml of fluid. Assess for the common signs and symptoms of hypovolemia, especially in the diuretic phase and hypervolemia in the oliguric phase. Potassium and sodium disturbances and other electrolyte imbalances that may occur in AKI. Because infection is a leading cause of death in AKI, meticulous aseptic technique is critical. Be alert for local manifestations of infection like swelling, redness, pain, as well as systemic manifestations of infection like fever, malaise, and leukocytosis. Temperature may not always be elevated. Nephrotoxic drugs should be administered judicially. judiciously. Dosages may have to be reduced. Ambulatory and home care. Recovery from AKI is highly variable and depends on the existence of other organ system failures, the general condition and age of the patient, the length of the oliguric phase, and the severity of nephron damage. Protein and potassium intake should be regulated in accordance with the kidney function. Follow-up care and regular evaluation of kidney function are necessary. Teach the patient the signs and symptoms of recurrent kidney disease emphasize measures to prevent the recurrence of AKI. The long-term convalescence period of 3 to 12 months may cause psychosocial and financial hardships for both the patient and the family. Make appropriate referrals for counseling as appropriate. Perform skin care and take measures to prevent pressures, pressure ulcers because most patients develop edema as well as decreased muscle tone. Mouth care is important for preventing stomatitis which develops when pneumonia in saliva irritates the mucous membrane. So the evaluations are patient will regain and maintain normal fluid and electrolyte balance, comply with the treatment regimen, experience no untoward complications and have complete recovery. Gerontology considerations. Older adults are at risk for the same causes of AKI as are younger adults. However, they are more susceptible to AKI due to dehydration from diuretics and laxatives, from acute febrile illnesses and um, hypotension, antibiotics, um, obstructive disorders like prostatic hyperplasia, etc. Impaired function of other organ systems from cardiovascular disease or diabetes can also increase the risk for developing AKI. The aging kidney is less able to compensate for changes in fluid volumes, solute load, and cardiac output. Thus, we went through AKI, the meaning of kidney failure, azotemia, the different causes um, which are related to pre 
renal, intrarenal, and postrenal, the different stages, which are the oliguric, diuretic, and the recovery phase, the clinical manifestations of these different stages, the diagnostic studies and treatment, and also the nursing management.